Tens of thousands of Palestinians have fled their homes in the southern town of Rafah as Israel intensifies the assault on the Gaza Strip. Palestinians reported Israeli airstrikes hit homes, mosques, and tunnels in the area. Meanwhile, Agence France Press quoted witnesses as saying that dozens of Israeli tanks had entered southern Gaza and were heading towards Rafah. Fierce fighting was also reported between Palestinian fighters and Israeli soldiers around Khan Yunus. Uh, earlier today, the U.N. said Israeli forces fired on one of its relief convoys trying to pick up supplies. Al Jazeera reports at least one Palestinian was killed and two others injured in the attack. Meanwhile, Israel continued its bombardment of Gaza with 60 airstrikes overnight. Residents described it as among the heaviest bombardments since the offensive began. Al Jazeera reports at least 700 Palestinians, including 219 children, have died in, in Gaza since Israel began its assault on December 27th. More than 3,000 people have been wounded. Ten Israelis have died over the same 13-day period, including seven soldiers, four of them by so-called friendly fire. On the diplomatic front, efforts to secure a truce in Gaza continue, with a senior Israeli official due to travel to Cairo to hear details of a ceasefire plan drawn up by Egypt and France. Uh, Israel said on Wednesday it accepted the principles of the proposal, but wanted to study the plan. A Hamas delegation is expected in Cairo at some stage for parallel talks. Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas is due to arrive on Friday. Meanwhile, the U.N. Security Council seems deadlocked over the crisis. Arab countries want the council to vote on a resolution calling for a ceasefire, while Britain, France and the U.S. are pushing for a weaker statement welcoming the Egypt-France proposal. We turn now to a discussion on the crisis in Gaza, the U.S. role in the conflict and what the prospects are for the incoming Obama administration. Martin Indyk is the former U.S. ambassador to Israel and assistant secretary of state for Near East Affairs during the Clinton administration. He's currently the director of the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. He has a new book out. It's called Innocent Abroad, an intimate account of American peace diplomacy in the Middle East. He's an advisor to Hillary Clinton, who was tapped to be Obama's secretary of state and is among those mentioned as a potential special envoy to the Middle East. Martin Indyk joins us from Washington. D.C. We're also joined by Norman Finkelstein here in New York, leading critic of Israeli foreign policy, the author of several books, including The Holocaust Industry, Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, and Beyond Chutzpah. We turn first to Ambassador Indyk. Um, can you explain why you think Israel began this assault almost two weeks ago now? Good morning, Amy. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Uh, I feel a little bit uh, sandbagged here. I was not told that I was going to be in some kind of debate with Norman Finkelstein. I'm not interested in doing that. I'm also not here as a spokesman for Israel, um, but I will try to answer your questions as best I can. I think that uh, what uh, happened here was that uh, there was a ceasefire, that, uh, an informal ceasefire between Hamas and uh, and Israel that had lasted for about five months. Um, Hamas uh, decided to break that ceasefire with a, a prolonged series of uh, rocket attacks on uh, Israeli civilians in southern Israel. And uh, the Israeli government uh, responded with uh, overwhelming uh, force designed, as they have said, to try to uh, re-establish uh, deterrence uh, to uh, prevent Hamas from doing that again and uh, to try to get a ceasefire in place that would uh, prevent Hamas from uh, smuggling in uh, offensive weapons into Gaza, the better to attack uh, Israel. Mm. Um, Norman Finkelstein, your assessment of the uh, of why Israel attacked now? Well, the record is fairly clear. You can find it on the Israeli website, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. Uh, Mr. Indyk is correct that the Hamas had adhered to the ceasefire from June 17th until November 4th. On November 4th, here Mr. Indyk, I think, goes awry. The record is clear. Uh, Hamas, uh, Israel broke the ceasefire by going into the Gaza and killing six or seven Palestinian militants. At that point, and now I'm quoting the official Israeli website, Hamas retaliated, or in retaliation for the Israeli attack, uh, then launched the missiles. Now, as to the reason why, the record is fairly clear as well. According to Haaretz, <clears throat> Defense Minister 
Barak began plans for this invasion before the ceasefire even began. In fact, according yesterday's, to yesterday's Haaretz, the plans for the invasion began in March. And the main reasons for the invasion, I think, are twofold. Number one, as Mr. Indyk, I think, correctly points out, to enhance what Israel calls its deterrence capacity, which in layman's language basically means Israel's capacity to terrorize the region into submission. After their defeat in July 2006 in Lebanon, they felt important to transmit the message that Israel is still a fighting force, still capable of terrorizing those who dare defy its word. And the, same, the second main reason for the attack is because Hamas was signaling that it wanted a diplomatic settlement of the, of the conflict along the June 1967 border. That is to say, Hamas was signaling they had joined the international consensus, it had joined most of the inter international community, overwhelmingly the international community, in seeking a diplomatic settlement. And at that point, Israel was faced with what Israelis call <clears throat> a Palestinian peace offensive. And in order to defeat the peace offensive, they sought to dismantle Hamas. I'd like to, well, Ambassador Indyk, uh, this issue of uh, supporters of Israel say repeatedly that Hamas is still committed to the destruction of Israel. Uh, is your sense that over the last year or so there has been some kind of a change in, in the, in the uh, viewpoints of the Hamas leaders? No, I don't think there's any uh, uh, evidence of that. Uh, uh, Hamas is very clear that uh, it will not uh, make peace with Israel, it will not recognize Israel. Its intention is to destroy the Jewish state, that it's an abomination in the midst of the uh, Arab uh, heartland, Islamic uh, world, and so on. And um, I don't see that there's any change in that whatsoever. I think the change that's taken place is a change on the ground. Hamas, uh, having won the uh, PA elections, and then uh, th we don't need to go into the details of that, but. Essentially, what happened was, as a result of a, a, a competition between Hamas and Fatah over who would rule, Hamas took control of Gaza uh, by force in what was, in effect, a putsch uh, against the Palestinian Authority. Um, and it therefore uh, moved from being a, a terrorist organization to a terrorist government uh, responsible for uh, controlling territory in Gaza and uh, responsible for meeting the needs of one and a half million Palestinians in Gaza. That was a fundamental change in Hamas's organization. By the way, it was a change which was hotly contested within Hamas. The external leadership of Hamas, which is based in Damascus, led by Khaled Mashal, was at the time uh, deeply opposed to the uh, idea of taking control of Gaza precisely because he did not want to be responsible for meeting the needs of, of the Gazans. But the militants uh, of Hamas in Gaza um, decided to um, take on uh, Fatah and, uh, and kick them out. Uh, and, and as a consequence, Hamas was then placed in a dilemma. Uh, it may, over time, uh, as they face the consequences of having to uh, rule in uh, Gaza, it may over time uh, moderate their position. Um, certainly now they have to consider, uh, in the context of the diplomatic efforts underway that you detailed for a uh, ceasefire, um, what is more important to them? Uh, continuing their ability to attack Israel from uh, Gaza, uh, and in that case they will not accept the kind of arrangements that Israel is now insisting on that would prevent them smuggling in offensive weapons, or uh, whether they want to focus on meeting the needs of the Palestinian people. For that purpose, they will need the opening of the passages so that goods and people can flow in and out of Gaza. In other words, they're going to face a choice between whether they want to have the ability to use this a uh, ceasefire eventually when it will be established to continue uh, their what they call resistance, what uh, normally we understand as violence and, and, and terrorism against uh, civilians, whether they're going to continue that 
uh, or whether they're going to focus on meeting the needs of the people that they are responsible for in Gaza. Um, and that dilemma, as I say, over time may lead to a moderation, but I don't see it yet.